Satisfied God Podcast. This is Raven Bird with you once again. Thanks for downloading this new episode and sharing it. Uh, I appreciate you uh, going to whatever site, whatever um, outlet that you do use to uh, view these or listen to these audio podcasts. Uh, just It's just wonderful to know that you're out there, and I appreciate it. Let me just say, uh, thank you very much to you guys who are helping uh, financially, uh, supporting. Uh, it's very, very helpful. Ray, Jan, thanks a lot for what you're doing. Emily, um, Julie, R- Randy, uh, William, all, all of you guys, it's... Um, uh, Cindy, you guys are, and that's just to name a couple, but you guys are, are truly amazing at how, uh, you're supporting. Uh, it's just amazing to me to know that anyone's out there that actually, um, feels that this is worthy of that support. And, uh, hopefully, um, you know, what we do here is really being a blessing to you and helping you in some way. Uh, I'm, as you hear a car passing by, I'm actually sitting outside right now, uh, outside of my house under the trees. We've got a little, uh, picnic table area here that I've, I've made. And so it's, uh, about 10 30 at night <clears throat> and I'm sitting out here. It's got a nice little breeze blowing, not enough to interrupt the microphone again, but I like sitting out here, so I thought I'd do this here tonight. I want to continue in our look in Romans 8. Today we're going to get into verse 3 and verse 4, but we'll focus a lot on verse 3 tonight. Um, In our last time together, we were focusing on Paul's declaration of freedom and his declaration of liberty from, well, let let me say it this way, because I think this is a real issue uh, with people. Uh, This seems to be an issue anyway. Um, Because a lot of people, it seems, think that uh, we are forgiven of sins and that in that we have it, have a liberty from doing wrong making mistakes you know we we're brought from making mistakes doing bad things doing wrong things to doing right things not doing wrong things not making mistakes but then once we make a mistake that that whole thing, that whole thing begins to be thrown into disarray. I get questions all the time, man, I make mistakes. I have all these issues. What about my salvation? And although even right now, when I answer those questions in the reality that I'm seeing in Christ, the reality that I'm I'm understanding in the seeing of the Lord and in this wonderful study in just these few chapters of Romans, I am able to share with them the absoluteness of their salvation in a way that I never could previously. Because even in my mind, in my heart, in my mind, in my beliefs, in my uh, comprehension of things, the continuation of, you know, mistakes being made, problems being had, issues, Falling, failing, to me those things still, and I'll I'll use these words, these things still posed a grave threat to the certainty of our relationship with God. They posed a real issue. And some of those things seem to pose a great issue at so much so that they seem to pose a situation where you could be fully, completely disqualified from relationship with God at all. But it it occurs to me with that kind of thought, now it does especially, 
And I get those answers now, and thank God I can answer them in certainty and not in the vacillations of natural reasonings and the gray areas, loopholes of a natural mind trying to assess spiritual reality and the certain certainty and sureness of spiritual reality, looking at natural men, looking at flesh and blood, looking at the woeful deficiency of ourselves. But thank God now I can see the certainty of it, the absoluteness of our state, of our relationship with God rests solely upon the shoulders of one. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, just as the high priest had the Israel two onyx stones resting upon his shoulders with the names of the tribes of Israel upon it. There is a weight that rests upon him solely and securely, and that is the weight of covenant, covenantal relationship with God. And where I thought those things were so strong and so significant in that they determined the level of relationship with God, I realize now there is only one thing that determines the validity, the measure, and the absoluteness of the soul's relationship with God. And that is whether or not Christ himself dwells in it. There's That's one thing. That's the only thing that determines the level of relationship and the and the certainty of that relationship. It's only fully, completely defined in him. If we have him dwelling in us, we have his relationship with God dwelling in us, and he is that relationship with God. So the liberty that Paul is describing here is not, and you hear fireworks is close to July the 4th. These folk love them. The freedom and liberty that Paul is addressing and speaking of, the liberty and freedom that Paul, the deliverance that Paul is speaking of in, in these verses is not from wrongdoing, mistakes being made to, to right doing and no more mistakes. That's where we get messed up. It is from the inward governing law of sin and death that it's enslaved him from within to a man, to a creation of corruption and vanity. He has been delivered from that. And again, it is tremendously unfortunate that we have minimized that so much in the church, in Christianity, in our teachings. Because this utter freedom, this absolute deliverance of which Paul writes has very has very much been downgraded to forgiveness of bad deeds and past mistakes with merely the promise of assistance by God of those who have been forgiven or further forgiveness when you fail again or do something else that's wrong. The issue is salvation, which is exactly what Paul is describing, is not deliverance from bad to good, from wrong to right, from a bar hopper to a church attendee, what we are looking at as a God-wrought deliverance is from death unto life. Let that sink in for a moment. From death unto life. From darkness unto light. From corruption to incorruption. And that's extremely important for us to understand. There is a a verse, if you go on here in these chapters in Romans, Romans 8 says it this way, because what this shows us, see, if it's from, from, from wrong to right and from bad to good, then we have a very vital role to play and any mistake will, will bring illegitimacy to that state and it'll say okay now you got to try you got to do it over you got to try it again try harder and you're not back down the ladder another rung or two take one step forward two steps back every time you make a mistake every time there's an error every time there's something wrong and again i'm not lauding the qualities of error 
I'm not making light of things like that. I'm not saying, let's do it. Hey, great, let's sin so grace may abound. No. I'm saying that there is a grace that abounds that has freed us from sin altogether, fully and completely. And that utter deliverance from from sin and death by the abounding grace of God is not from me doing wrong to now me doing right because what happens the moment you're not doing right whatever your definition of right is and that's another issue what happens what's changed has something changed has something of the eternal reality of Christ in you changed has your state of being changed has God's relationship to your soul changed we believe it is when that is the issue doing right now not doing wrong being better not being bad the reality of it is uttered in the words of Paul not I but Christ that's why it is important to realize that not I but Christ is the liberty of the soul from the moment it is born again that is where you begin it is a state of rest it is a state of completeness it is a state of being in which you are known of God in absolute complete and full perfection because the one in whom you are known is the perfect man himself the son of his love that one lives in you defines life defines righteousness in the sight of God within you not I but Christ not of us but of God of God not of us not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. But here's another verse. If you carry on again, and we may in these classes go on into chapter 9. It's very interesting. This is uh, Romans 9 and verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Do you see that? Now, this is very significant in the context that it's written in, but it, it applies to all of what we're saying. Your intentions, your that's what the word means, a sp- certain inclination, strong inclination, strong um, intention. But it's not of him that intends or has strong inclinations in moving toward this and trying to do it, that desires with all his heart, wants to do it. Isn't that what Paul faced in Romans 7 where we've been for a long period of time? To do is present. That's one that wills and desires. That's what he has a strong intention and inclination toward the good that the law describes. But how to perform it, I find not. What does that mean? That means you are in need of one thing and one thing only. There's only one thing that can remedy that state, and that's the mercy of God. Mercy. Not of him that runs, wills, performs, even perfectly. None of it. It's mercy that has brought this about. It's mercy that has brought your soul into a perfect, unbreakable relationship with God the Father through his Son, in his Son. It is a Son who is the covenant of God wrought in your soul, written, engraved into your heart. That is the distinction. That's the deliverance we're talking about. From death unto life. Problem is, and here's the question, because there's other verses we can go into. We can go in more of this darkness and light. You who are sometimes darkness, now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. That's walking in the comprehension of a state of being. That comprehension comes when we see him who is the light See him who is the day. See him who is the condition of the soul in its fullness. That's absolutely right. But even before we see him, there is this state that is true of the soul. 
in him life was existing and this aforementioned life was the light of men and the light in the darkness is constantly shining and the darkness did not overwhelm it why are you light now in the lord because that light who is also the life, the life we're talking about that's freed us from the law of sin and death is now resident in your soul. See, the question in my heart, the question that's been there a long time, and now I finally understand why that question was always there. Why do we still insist on fighting a fight that has already been won? Why do we assist, insist on dying to sin over and over and over when he who lives in us has died unto sin once and for all? And this one who is eternally dead to sin and el- uh, eternally alive unto God lives in us as our very life. Why do we assist, insist on swinging at an enemy that's not even there to hit? I believe the occupation of the heart should be regarding the light who is the life that has freed us. It should be the setting of our hearts upon his appearing that we may know that unto which we have been called. The abounding of the grace of God that has been bestowed. See, John even writes in his letter, his epistle, that the darkness, you who were once darkness, the darkness is past, for the true light now shines. You see the death unto life, darkness unto light. These are realities that he has done. These are not things that we are continually trying to rid ourselves of one so that we can acquire more of the other. There has been a clean, clear, definite, and eternal division between these two things. And these two things come to be identified in two men. And we've talked about that throughout these classes. The darkness is past, the true light now shines. See, we read also that death has no sting or power over the incorruptible life of the seed. See, doesn't that sound a whole lot like old things are passed away? Behold, the new has come. And in the context of those verses, he says, and all things are of God. Not of us, right? All things are of God. Yet we're still led to believe that the residue of death, the residue of darkness and corruption are still present, needing to be further crucified. The issues are still dealt with as viable and yet surviving things. Scripture says you are dead and your life is residing within a perfect eternal relationship, as Colossians chapter 3 plainly says. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It is residing securely within a perfect eternal relationship that can and shall be made manifest, if you keep reading there in Colossians 3, to the recognition of the soul, when Christ, our life, appears in, inwardly, when the one who is present, defining, measuring, being that perfect relationship with God, being the very embodiment of the hope of glory that they under the old covenant administration possessed, that hope, that that expectation, him now being in you, that hope fulfilled and hope realized. We're going to, we'll get into that in this chapter in Romans 8. That is made manifest, and it's so manifestly known to the soul. Not, it doesn't happen when he appears. You see what has already happened when Christ, the hope of glory, came to reside in you. You see what Paul has been saying. You are complete in him. That means lacking nothing. Your order is perfect. You have been baptized. You have been circumcised 
with a circumcision, cir- circumcision not made with hands. You have, and that being the putting off of an entire body of sins. And that's why Paul necessitates or stresses the necessity of setting the affection of the heart upon what is above, not earthly things, not that which is the earth. That's not Walmart and Burger King. Earthly in reference to the insistence of religiously motivated, naturally minded man attempting to find in himself, utilizing whatever implementations he can find. To find in himself completeness, sanctification, holiness, righteousness that God has already brought into the soul of those who are dwelling in and are the dwelling place of Christ, the hope of glory. See, my question is, can we actually just look at these words and not at least consider that they mean a great deal more than we have thought. We're dealing with the expectation of God here, birth within an entire creation, culminating in one Son who now by grace resides in us. To me, that is more wonderful than I can sit here and imagine. And we just read over it and carry about our business trying to be like God, trying to be holy, trying to be righteous. When this is saying that righteousness, holiness, if you look at the the Hebrew writings in the Talmud in different places, you'll realize that everything for that nation of Israel, everything for them under that under that age of expectation, or as Athanasius, as St. Athanasius called it, a time of preparation for reality. Everything for them under that age, under that time, hinged upon the coming of one man, their Messiah. Because in that one man, their teachings stated very plainly and vehemently, That in that one man, everything of their hopes, everything promised, everything prophesied by by the fathers and by prophets would come to pass because it all came when he came. There would be nothing that he in his coming would not bring with him. His reward is with him. Nothing missing when he comes. You understand? And we in the church today are still preaching something yet to be lack, something still missing and lacking. Even when he's there, even when he's there. And I'm talking about the fullness of righteousness and the fullness of death to sin. If he's there, that's there. Death to sin is there. Death to death is there because the one whom death and sin have no hold upon now resides within me and is made unto me all that he is. Oh, what a beautiful salvation. (laughs) Beautiful salvation. See, we're dealing with something wonderful here. How can just... Christ being in us as this life that frees us from the law of sin and death. We're going to get into verse 3 here in a moment. I didn't even read the verses. I apologize. But how can how can that, that reality, merely be something that ensures or guarantees that something greater or better is coming down the line? And that's how we preach it. Jesus is good, but not enough. There's more. Whether it's coming in an event or coming in the development of spiritualities in yourself, the development of spiritual attributes and characteristics through a plethora of different disciplines that you're to give or 
involve yourself in. There's nothing wrong with discipline. There is something wrong with discipline when you believe that the end of it is Christ-likeness or holiness or perfection. When you're born again, that gift comes. It's a gift of grace. How can that be merely something ensuring something more and not actually the greater and full culmination of what has always been promised in times past? See, well, I hate to get off on this, but let me just mention it just a second, but In Romans 8, we're going to talk about the hope in which God subjected an entire creation to their own vanity, but it says in hope. He did it in hope with an expectation, and and the expectation he subjected the creation in or with is the very thing that Paul is describing as his very own personal experience of liberty, deliverance, the liberty of the sons of God, deliverance from sin and death, deliverance from that enslavement of the inward condition of sin and death. The whole thing was wrapped up in hope, in God's own expectation. And he's saying that hope has been fulfilled through Christ in you. That hope has been fulfilled through the life of that one bringing such deliverance from death that could not be brought about otherwise. And then if you go into Galatians 5, which we'll do this when we get into the realities, what Paul describes in in chapter 8 with the hope being in view here. He's talking to Galatians who are attempting to go back, not attempting, but being swayed by Judaizers to go into the law to find what is lacking in Christ, what is missing with just faith, just believing. It's not enough. Got to add these external accoutrements to it to make it actually valid and make it actually real because it's not real when it's just Jesus. You've got to add your part to it so they bring the law into it. Well, Paul says this very plainly, that if anyone is trying to find righteousness by the works of the law, he has fallen from grace. That steps outside the boundaries of grace, trying to find the realities of grace outside of the boundaries, where it will never be found, because it's only found one place. And he says, and I'll just paraphrase it, not read it, but he says, those of us who are spiritual or of the spirit, governed by the spirit, walking in the spirit, We do wait. We don't go out trying to find righteousness by works just because we're ignorant of a righteousness that's already present. We wait on the appearing of the righteousness of God by faith. You understand? We wait on it. We wait patiently in The reality of it, we wait for the reality in which we now live to appear so that we will not in vanity seek it somewhere else, but know it where it truly is found. And that's in the present life of Christ within. It's the hope appearing, the very hope of righteousness that a creation was subjected to. Four. Paul saying, that's what you have. Now, the, uh, it's not hoping for it. It's the very object. We wait for the hoped for righteousness. We wait for the righteousness, which was the very hope, the object of an entire creation. We wait on his appearing because he's now in you. I'm saying that very poorly and I apologize, but it, it We'll get into that as as we go. Sorry. So I, I don't want to really go on into this. I want to get into uh, these other verses of Romans. But I, we'll stop looking at verse 1 and 2 here. Uh, not stop, but go beyond that by uh, reading a commentary by Kenneth Wiest. And this is what he says about Romans 
Basically, this is Romans 8, 2 through 4, his commentary. He says, the law here, speaking of the law of the spirit of life, the law here is not a written law, but a regulative principle which exercises control in the believer. The control over life is exercised by the spirit. One could translate this verse for the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus. One could also interpret the regulative principle of the spirit, namely the life which is in Christ Jesus. This has freed me from the principle of sin and death. At the moment, listen, when this happens, according to Kenneth Weiss, at the moment I put my trust in the Lord and was saved. He says here, it is Romans 6 in a nutshell. And that's pretty well true. Romans 6 shows us the deliverance from one man to another through baptism, death, being raised with Christ, now having Christ in us, and now the the one who is dead unto sin and alive unto God now resident within us, leaving one thing, recognition, reckoning this to be so. Not so that would be so, because it is so if you're baptized into Christ, if you are born of the Spirit. Yes, Christ is in you. But there is a recognition that brings the soul into an uh, an enjoyment of what God has wrought in his Son. It brings the soul into a true appreciation and recognition of the singularity and the singleness of your relationship with God, that it is not defined or measured by yourself, but from the by the life of another who now is present in you. So he goes on and says, Alfred, who is another commentator, says the law of the spirit of life, having freed him from the law of sin and death, so he now serves another master. Remember, we read that in Romans 6. Romans 6, uh, maybe verse 18. Yeah, being then made free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. He now serves another master. Or let's say it this way. Another master has claimed him. And we've talked about this enslavement before in previous podcasts. You could go back and listen to that, the liberty of our enslavement. And I believe that's a crucial uh, part of this. All claim of sin on him is at an end. He is acquitted. There is no condemnation for him. Why? Because Christ lives in him, the one who is now eternally dead to sin, death, sin, Corruption has no, absolutely no claim upon him. He has totally defeated that realm. We have to understand the state of my soul is utterly dependent upon the state of the one who lives in it. Keep that in mind as we go. Keep it in mind always. You determine nothing, but you are the partaker of the one who determines everything whether in Adam or in Christ. Remember, it was either not I but Adam or now not I but Christ. It can only be two things. You were never related to God independent of a man. You've always been known of God, related to by God, whether in Adam or in Christ. Never, never any other way. Subjection to the law of sin and death. Why? Because of a state of sin, because you're in Adam. That involves condemnation. This is the commentary. Emancipation from that leaves no place for condemnation. Again, that is determined because the man in whom you are found, the man whose seed you are born of, determines that. Paul says in Galatians 3.21, a law which is able to give life, not an impotent law written on tables of stone. Hence, righteousness comes by it. And it proves more than a match for the authority exercised over man by the forces of sin and death. Meaning this, that now this is the whole thought. Read If you read that in Galatians 3, 
about the seed coming, about the law not being able to give the life that it describes or else righteousness would have been by the law. It's right here. This is Romans. And it not only poses that dilemma because of the weakness of the law here that we're going to read about in in Romans 3 or Romans 8 verse 3. But it shows how that was remedied. It shows the fix, the solution to that. And it's not you better. It's not you without mistakes. It's you dead and Christ himself living in you as your only life. Dead to sin. Dead to Adam. Dead to death. And now by the grace of God, alive, having one life, living by the life of another, living by the life of the perfect man who is dead indeed unto sin, that sin and death have no claim upon him, that it has no corruptibility at all in him. You see, there's a verse that's very important as far as I'm concerned. With this, because to me, most people see these things in, again, good and bad, sin, not sinning. That's how we look at it. But look at this verse. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter nine. Verse 20. Let me just go to verse 19. For though I be free from all men, this is Paul, Paul, Paul speaking. Are writing, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. See, some will read that, and I'll, man, that's, that doesn't make sense, does it? This is a man free from the law. It gets better. Verse 21, to them that are without the law, I am as one without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak, I am as weak. You see what he's saying? This is so beautiful. These words are written from a standpoint of sureness and a standpoint of absolutely no condemnation. A a comprehension, a life that is there is no condemnation in. Not Paul in and of himself. No, no, he understands the law by which he now lives, the life that is now present within him. And he writes these things out of that comprehension, from that perspective. And that's why he can say, "I'm to the Jew, I am as a Jew. To those without the law, I am as those without the law. Not because he is a man that has no inner compass or core belief. He's not compromising. Why can he be this way and it not be compromised? How can he be as if without law, yet that does not mean lawless? Because he says, not without law unto God, I have the law of Christ. That's the law we're reading of in Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. He is no longer governed by a law that gives a form but no substantiation that speaks of righteousness but cannot provide it. You see, when the law, and I I say these things because of this, when the law is your guide, earthly instructions, man-centered teachings, and flesh and blood is your only reference point, You cannot relate 
to anyone except within the context and the confines of that particular realm of understanding and belief. You cannot deal with them and declare that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Because to you, those two things are very significant in and of themselves, and they demand a choice. You have to pick a side. You see, when the new divine law is in you and governs you, you can declare that neither of those things are of any effect. Neither of those things are sufficient. But Christ within is all that avails. You can't say to someone when flesh is your reference point that if your heart condemns you, God is even greater than your heart. Because you will, un- you will never understand that what God beholds in the face of the perfect man, his beloved son, is far greater and more substantial than what you may behold in your own face. You will believe that your subjective thoughts are more sure and more valid than the objective reality wrought of God. That's why the great and perfect and complete salvation that abides presently in Us must be revealed in us. We must see the king whom God has set upon his holy hill of Zion. He must be known to the heart in which his kingdom has come. And in that recognition, the soul and all else that pertains to it is subdued in understanding in accordance to a present reality, that present reality being not I, but Christ. One life, (laughs) one life, one righteousness, the singularity of it, the perfection of it, defined in the perfect one, who is the fruitful, abounding, abundant one. And now, Paul will further elaborate on this liberty, this state of freedom, as well as the means of it. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. For what the law could not do. Let me just read all of these verses. Read starting in verse 1. Again, not going to rehash it any more than I have already. Sorry. Uh, This may be a super duper sized version here. Um, Verse one of Romans eight. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Again, that phrase is not there, but it's in chapter, it's in verse four. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, where we're going to focus for the rest of this time and a little beyond. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according or after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, for the time we have here, whatever time we take here, the law had a weakness. What the law could not do in that it was weak. The word here, weak, means impotent. Weak. It means impossible, impossibility. In fact, uh, Weiss, Kenneth Weiss, says that this 
This could actually be translated literally the impossible thing of the law or the impossibility of the law. You see, the whole thing here, Jesus did not, the life, the one who now lives in us by new birth, the life that has freed us from sin and death, that governing principle, that law. He did not condemn us as did the law. But he brought about, and this is what 3 and 4 say, he brought about the full execution of the pronouncement of guilt. He did not just say, you're guilty, you're not him, but he put to death the man of flesh, the man of sin, the man the law could condemn but could not change. And now that living, perfect, glorified one is raised as the life-giving spirit, the second man to whom the soul born from above is married. The the soul now married to that risen one. Remember, if he be not risen, you're still in your sin. It's very significant. Because, see, the objective of this was never to change the Adamic man, but to bring about a true change, which is from that man of corruption to the man of spiritual perfection and substance. And that's who lives in you if you're born of God. But see, the impossibility of the law was not caused by man himself. Man didn't cause this ineffectual state of the law because mankind was never capable of doing it, was never able to get it done, to do it right. It's very plain. The ineffectualness of the law described here is first that it could never release the soul from the bondage of an inward condition of sin and death. And secondly, it could not furnish the life that it demanded. The law could condemn mankind of sin, but could never sever that man from sin and provide the one righteous life that it necessitated and commanded. When Paul in Galatians, and this is, I guess, controversial to some, <clears throat> in Galatians, <clears throat> Paul, uh, chapter 2, we, and, we, and this is very familiar to us all who, who have been in this gospel to any, any time at all, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, not chapter 2, chapter 1. But it, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace. That's not two separate things. That is the one thing having this effect. He separated me from my mother's womb by calling me by grace. The grace of God by which he called me is the means by which he separated me from my mother's womb. Now, the whole mother's womb thing is an argument in theology. And theological circles, but I, I believe that the primary meaning of that is the mother that he addresses in chapter <clears throat> chapter four of this same letter, and that is when he makes the distinction between Hagar and Sarah. There was a mother, Hagar, that of the earth, meaning natural Israel, the 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 system, that religion, the Jewish religion, that being the mother. That's the mother from which he is primarily being spoken of here as being separated. Now, if you want to take it to a natural mother, you can, because it all kind of comes into, comes into play as well. But here's the issue. The severing, the separation was not something Paul did. It could do. It was grace. Remember, not of him that wills or desires or runs, but of the one who shows mercy. God did this brought about this severing. And it's going to be very important that the word severed or separated is the word severed. And it also, it doesn't just mean cut in two or cut away from. It means to be brought within specific boundaries. 
to be brought into a place of boundaries, brought into a place where there is true walls or boundaries set. That's what the grace of God has done. And we could go into Nehemiah and Ezra when they erected the walls and then the law was read and what they did. We can get into that where they, they put out the seed, the mixed seed, those who were that had had children and married women who were not of the seed of Israel. They had to put them away. Because nothing but the seed, one seed, can abide within the walls or the enclosed boundaries of grace. God has done such a thing. It's an understanding that we are able to cast out put away what God has already cast out of his sight. I say we are sanctified in understanding from that from which we've already been separated in reality. Those who preach sanctification as a continual process are half right, but he also says that he is our sanctification. And that God has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Our sanctification in understanding is a progressive thing where you know that from which you have been severed and you comprehend that work of the cross that has brought about the end of one entire thing and brought you into another thing altogether that is glorious where the other thing is not glorious at all. But that sanctification is a once and for all work of God. The law was weak through the flesh. See, this is basically a retelling of Romans 7 and Romans 6, in a way. The whole of this verse, I mean, it's like Romans 6 and Romans 7 rolled up into a ball. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh deals another nod to the inward conflict and the governing law that we read of in Romans 7. And it made anything outward, any perfect adherence to the Mosaic law without any effect. It made it null and void. And it could never bring it to its ultimate spiritual aim because the law was spiritual. Paul was carnal. The law had a spiritual aim. Paul, when the law had a, having a spiritual aim was applied to Paul, there's the weakness that the law could never provide the thing it demanded. Jameson Fawson Brown says this way, the law could irritate. Our sinful nature, is his wording, into more action, as we have seen, but it could not secure its own fulfillment. How that is accomplished comes to be shown in these verses. You see, the law perpetuated an ongoing conflict. When I say that, I mean the law of Moses up applicable to the man who is governed by the law of sin and death, a, a totally contradictory law to the law's intent, the law of Moses' intent, which was a spiritual end, which is Christ himself. It perpetuated an ongoing conflict in that it presented the nature and the divine perfection of one man and yet was applied to the corruption of another. Applied to a man who falls short. No matter what the external distinctions, Jew, Gentile, male, female, it doesn't matter. Paul says they're all concluded under sin in disobedience. Because the law declared the necessity of one perfect life and Jew, Gentile, male, female, none of those things, having the law applied to it, could couldn't bring that about. That could never happen. Why? Because life is now the issue. Not perfect adherence, life. We're going to get in that in a moment.
In fact, when you go to Numbers chapter, Numbers chapter 15, verse 29, it says that there shall be one law for all, whether they be native to, to Israel or strangers in Israel. One law. And what does that mean? This testifies concerning one life, that one life that Paul now writes. There is one life that governs this. If you're found here, one life governs. There's no conflict here. I think this is Weist here. He goes on, he says, the death, burial, and resurrection brought about the ultimate solution by raising up one new man in whom the power and rule of sin and death had no authority. There's 1 Corinthians 15 stated. This whole thing that we're reading about right now in Romans 8, 3 and 4 is 1 Corinthians 15. It is from the first man who is of the earth earthly to the second man is who is the Lord from heaven. It is from the corruptibility of the first to the incorruptibility of the second. It is the victory that God has wrought so that the righteousness that God demands can now be fulfilled in the soul in whom the righteousness of God himself dwells. You read this in Hebrews 10, 1, what the law could not do, you read it very plainly. The law having a shadow of good things to come, but it was not the very image of the things, can never, with the sacrifices offered in that system, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect, could not bring about perfection because that perfection is not brought about by sacrifices and offerings. That perfection is the result of a presence of life. And this is vital because the nature of the Mosaic law was, according to this, and if you read it in Colossians 2, it was one of a shadow, form without substantiation. The law did not bring with its demands and perfection the substantiating life that it demanded. The written law could merely describe another man while being given to weak, impotent disease. That's another definition for the word. Disease. Remember, one commentary said that sin was the disease of the soul. Those who were without strength, it was applied to them. The law was actually never designed to bring substance within itself. It was designed to cause a heart who's under it to long for and lean forward unto the coming of the body or the man who cast such a glorious shadow. But as is true in nature, the coming of the substance of the shadow renders that shadow non-glorious and insignificant. Testimonial maybe, yes, but invalid as to substance. And to truth as to reality. See, that's Second Corinthians chapter 3. If you want to read those verses. This is what the true living presence of Christ brings about within. The exceeding glory of the second man resident within you. Do you see why the veil of flesh must be removed from the eyes of the soul that he inhabits? Why he must be revealed? Then we can live assuredly, cognizant of the liberty and the freedom that God in Christ has wrought by his Spirit. And we will not try to find that anywhere else or bring it about by any other means. There are so many other verses here that I want to get to, but let's read Acts chapter 13, verse 32 through 39. And we to you do proclaim good news, 
that the promise made unto the fathers, God hath in full completed this to us, their children, having raised up Jesus. This is the completing. See that? This is the completing of it. This is the promises made unto the fathers being fully completed. He's raised up Jesus as also in the second psalm it hath been written, My son thou art, I today have begotten thee, and that he did raise him up out of the dead. No more to return to corruption. He has said thus, I will give to you the faithful kindness or mercies of David. Wherefore also in another place he said, Thou shalt not give thy kind one to see corruption. For David indeed, his own generation having served by the will of God, did fall asleep and was added unto his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God did raise up did not see corruption. Let it therefore be known to you, men, brethren, that through this one, To you is forgiveness, is the forgiveness of sins declared. And from all things, from when, and from all things, listen to this part. This is the part I wanted to get to. This is the part I want you to see. That that through this one to you is the forgiveness of sins declared. And from all things from which you are not able in the law of Moses to be declared righteous. In this one, Christ, everyone who is believing is declared righteous. Why? Why? God has raised up one, and that one who is raised, who lives, and who lives as the life-giving spirit, the spirit of life, resides within those who were born of his seed. And in the thing through Moses, we could not be justified or declared righteous or made righteous. In this one, righteousness is a reality. Now the righteousness of the law, without the law, has been made manifest. The righteousness, yes, that the law described, but that you had to go with outside of the law to find. Which is the very root of Paul's argument with Peter in Galatians 2. And we dealt with this very same thing, remember? Uh, everyone who's believing is declared righteous. In Romans chapter 3, it says it very plainly. In verse 24, being declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God did set forth as a mercy seat through the faith in his blood for the showing forth of his righteousness because of the passing over of the bygone sins in the forbearance of God for the showing forth of his righteousness in the present time for his being righteous who him not you his being righteous and declaring him righteous who is of the faith of Jesus. Where then is the boasting? It was excluded by what law? Works? No, the law of faith. Therefore, do we reckon a man to be declared righteous by faith apart from the works of law? Very same thing being said. And this should bring to me a great appreciation and I have greater and greater appreciation for these words in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may tabernacle upon me or over me. Now, though some would say, okay, so we've got to be weak because his, I mean, his strength is only made perfect in our weakness. We need to be weak. We need to be humble. We need to be lowly. Listen, you already are. 
You were born corrupt, vain, empty, evil, wicked, wretched. And you think you have to humiliate and humble yourself to get that, get, get that way. <laughs> no, his sufficiency. See, his sufficiency does not require you lowering yourself. See the arrogance in that? No, his sufficiency is the thing that allows you to say, oh, It is not I. In my nothingness, he avails. In my impotence to produce or to achieve or to attain, he is my life. He is my righteousness. He is the priest that stands there defining in the sight of God a relationship that I have no hope of otherwise. Being in me a righteousness I have no hope of otherwise. See, and I glory in that. There's the glory in infirmities and weakness. The word sufficient here, my grace is sufficient, is interesting because it is akin to another word, and it can mean... It only, not only means to be sufficient, it also means to be satisfactory or to bring satisfaction. That's a, wonderful to think about. But it also has the idea of the raising of a barrier. The raising of a barrier, like a, a barrier or a wall or surrounding. See, this is... The compassion, this is, again, what we read in in, in Galatians 2. He severed me from my mother's womb. That means he brought me within an enclosed place, a place of set boundaries, a place where he has raised a barrier. Now I find in that, within those confines, those boundaries, everything of reality, look nowhere else, declare nothing else. See, this is the compassion and the mercy that he has had upon all who have been condemned by law. This is Romans 11, verse 32 through 33. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his ways past finding out. Romans 5, verse 6, this is in the Murdoch translation. And if at any time, on account of our weakness, Messiah died for the ungodly. I'm sorry, let me start that over. Romans uh, Romans 5, 6, this is the Murdoch translation. And if at this time, on account of our weakness, Messiah died for the ungodly. For rarely doth one die for the ungodly. Though for the good, some one perhaps would venture to die. God hath here manifested his love toward us. Because if when we were sinners, Messiah died for us, how much more shall we now be justified by his blood and be rescued from wrath by him? For if when we were enemies... God was reconciled with us by the death of his son. How much more shall we, in his reconciliation, live by his life? And not only so, but we also rejoice in God by means of our Lord Jesus, Messiah, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now, this is the mercy God's had. Now, let's show, basically, a verse that shows the dilemma of Romans 3. What the law could not do is weak through the flesh. Here's this situation, Romans 7. But God sent his own son. But let's see why. Let's let's see one thing that happened here. Let's, let's see it in one verse. I think we see the dilemma that was of necessity eliminated at the cross. James chapter 2, verse 10. 
For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he has become guilty of all, the whole thing. See, this standard is a standard of perfection. See, God is after perfection. Listen to these words. He is after perfection without even a stumble or a fault. Here we see why God had to do what is spelled out in Romans 8 and 3. He had to send his own son in the form of sinful, corrupt mankind. so that his mercy could be exercised. But how could he do that? He had to bring that man to death. He had to eliminate the source of all corruption. He had to put the axe to the root, so that the soul that is bound to that corruption could be forever freed from it and be married to another so that those who would now partake of the life of the perfect one could have the righteousness that would never be realized in flesh, in the Adamic man, could now be realized within, through the presence of, of the man of spirit, the man of perfection, the man of righteousness, the man of incorruption. Such perfection is never able to be achieved by the corruption that is in flesh and blood. In the literal version, this verse reads this way, God did shut up together the whole, the whole of man, the whole of mankind, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. In unbelief, that to the whole he might do kindness. Now again, this is the subjecting them to their own vanity that he's going to talk about in Romans 8 further on. It's the same thing here. He shut up that whole thing, all men, the Adamic man. Even the ones under the law trying to be perfect. Shut them all up. In sin, under sin, to unbelief. So that he might do kindness to them and show mercy to them. How awesome is his kindness toward us? Not I, but Christ. I am dead and he lives in me as my all. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 In this was manifested the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That means he might be our life, this very life that frees us from the the bondage and enslavement to sin and death. This is the love of God. This is not God hating us so much he killed us. This is God having mercy upon those bound to death, bound to sin, united with that man, that they may become in Christ, dead to that condition, that he would be made unto them. Life, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, under the heading, the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom, Paul says, that we speak to those who are perfect or brought to completion. We sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love. Look at this now. See, this flies in the face of most believers. Here in his love, not that we love God but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. The mercy seat. Isaiah 53, 10. 
Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, put him to grief. And thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He will prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, again, James 2.10. For whosoever shall keep the whole of the law and yet stumble in one point, he has become guilty of all. Now, the weakness of the law. This is according to James and Fawcett and Brown. The best manuscripts read, Whosoever shall have kept the whole law and yet shall have offended, literally stumbled, and it's not so strong as to fully fall down. It just means stumble, to make one error. In one point, he's guilty of the whole thing. I mean, the word for, for, for fin or stumble, it's just, it just means to stumble. It means to stagger. Just to make one false step. And it has just that intention. This doesn't speak of grave or even intentional sins, but just merely stumbling at one specific point. And while some take this and would make this a great point of condemnation, it is intended to do just the opposite. See, I had someone tell me a few months back. They said, this is not an all or nothing salvation. This is not an all or nothing salvation. But if you see the gravity of a statement like this, you better thank God for the grace that has provided and gifted to the soul the glorious all-or-nothing life of Christ. For if he is not all in you right now, you have absolutely nothing, and you are left in a condition where there is one point or one area that lacks sufficiency and that spells doom and utter failure for you. If it's true what Christianity is preached as today is that you've got some of Jesus and then the other parts are missing and they develop over time, God has transgressed his own standard. Because if the life of his son is the culmination of the law's intention, then for him to say you can't offend at one point of the law when you're doing it, but I can keep back a part when I'm doing it, that's ludicrous. That's why Romans 8 will say, He that sinned is not his own son, how shall he not with that son freely give us all things? That's saying... He's going to give us everything in that son. If there is one point that I can't even stumble at without being guilty of the whole thing, I'm telling you, that says to us that in Christ, the life that God has bestowed in his son, as his son, to my soul, lacks nothing. There is nothing insufficient in that life. There is nothing missing in that life. Not one jot, not one tittle, not one point, nothing lacking, nothing missing. That's perfect. That's salvation. That's wholeness. Remember, he, by his stripes, you were healed. That speaks of a wholeness, a salvation that misses nothing. If you see Romans 7, you see one who is perfect, touching the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. That's what you see in Romans 7. That's what he says in Romans 3. Same man. But who inwardly, even in that, inwardly he counters and contradicts the God-ordained meaning of the law. 
The only thing that ensures that there is no stumbling, no error, no staggering, is the life in whom perfect righteousness is personified and present. That life ensures no stumbling, no fault, no missing at any point. The moment you are the reference point for that statement, you will never, ever get out of that hole. Because you can't, you can't do it. And it was never intended for you to do it. God knew you were a contradiction to the whole thing to start with. See, in these words with James, you can see the level of divine precision that is actually demanded with God. Even, even in the testimony. But the one that ensures no fault, no falling, no stumbling is the life of Christ within. The one standing in the holy of holies, holy unto God upon his head. That's our head. That's the one head of his body. Jude 24 and 25 says, now to the one who is able to guard you from stumbling and to place you before the presence of his glory, faultless, in great rejoicing, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time, both now and forever. Amen. And if you read that and you look at that in a syntax notes or something like that, and you look at it in the, in the grammar of that verse in Jude, you'll see who is able is in the aorist active. And according to, uh, Wheeler syntax, t- syntax notes, it is a present condition based upon a past occurrence. And he, he, he describes it like this. He says it, it is an external viewpoint concerning an occurrence as a whole or in summary, including beginning and end. Wow. You see that? I hope that sinks in for just a moment. When he says this, who is able to keep you from falling, he's doing so in the viewpoint concerning the thing as a whole or in summary, including the beginning and the end point without any reference. This is the syntax notes here without reference to an eternal makeup or progress. That's from Wheeler syntax Greek notes. This has nothing to do with the internal progress, but as the whole of the thing, the full summary of it, including beginning and end, the one who says, I am the beginning and I am the end, determines this, not your progress in understanding who he is, but who he is. He is able from beginning to end to keep you and your little faults and failures, your little stumbles and, and, and mistakes. Do you think, do you think they at any point in time change who he is? Change the wholeness and the summarization of all spiritual realities in him and as him? Unfortunately, most of us determine the condition of the soul, the condition of our relationship with God based upon what progress we believe we are making. But there must be a divinely substantial substructure that holds us in the certainty of the whole of our salvation and beckons us on to comprehend in the seeing of his face, the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of all that he is from beginning to end or as the beginning and the end. 
The word there, keep us from falling, from falling is not stumbling. It also, in the Strong's, means without sin. Who keeps us without sin. Why? Sin is not something you do. Sin is a condition defined in a man, where righteousness is a condition defined in another man. So to be found in him who stands in the presence of the glory of God, blameless, faultless, perfect, and beloved, accepted of his Father. His state in the sight of his Father is graciously gifted to the soul as the state of the soul because he inhabits it. Why? Because he has put away sin. He has put away the contradiction. He has put away the corruption and the vanity. And he has called the soul that would hear his voice out from death to become dead to death, dead to sin, translated out of darkness into the kingdom of light. We have to understand with this. God's demand of this manner of perfection and state of non-stumbling has never changed to any degree. Not even a little bit. See, most people preach grace as, well, now he just overlooks you because he loves you so much. No. No. Grace of God is, I am dead, and my life is Christ. God doesn't have to tolerate me or overlook me or just love me so much. No, he has loved me so much that he has provided for me a death to one man and the life of another. He has severed my soul from the bondage to corruption by bringing me in by grace, into the confines of incorruption, perfect, divine righteousness. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful reality. What a great salvation. But he has not lowered his standard or demands of perfection, but he has now, this is, again, three and four, He has provided in the life of his beloved, risen, glorified son, the life that is error-free, stumble-free, where there is no fault, no blemish. And see, if you read back into Matthew 5, you understand that was always the intention. We've, We've talked about it. He says, I have come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Then he goes on to say in verse 20, Matthew 5, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Man, that's a lot to work for, isn't it? No, it's not a work at all. It's a gift of the grace of God. And then he goes on and says, you've heard it said that if you kill You shall not kill, but I say unto you, don't even be angry. If you're angry with your brother, you've already sinned. You said of them, you should not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her, it's committed adultery with her already in his heart. So again, this shows us, and again, these these verses are given to people, and they are condemned by it because they're like, dear God, if I couldn't do it, Now I've got to not even think it. It is true, however, that the demand, the perfection demanded of God has not been diminished. And Jesus understood that when God gave the law, he knew that mankind was not capable of actually living according to the ultimate conclusion of the law. Because the issue was never due to a lack of effort or a zealous hearted pursuit toward reaching a state of perfection through the works of the law. 
The issue was always and only one of kind and seed. The issue was one of death and sin as an inward law. And the only remedy was the presence of another life, one perfect life. By which the soul indwelt by that perfect life becomes dead to the life or the law of sin and death. I couldn't say the life because there's no life in it. We don't come and give our life to Jesus because you don't have a life to give him. He comes to give you life. And he gives himself his life, and he lives in you as that life. And he desires to reveal himself as life in you, that you may live and know who truly is your life, that you may live in the comprehension of him as that life, and realize that that life has within itself everything of divine reality. The law of one perfect life has made my soul free from the law of sin and death, Paul would write. Now, he says, Jesus says, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes of the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a heavy verse to some that means wow that's a that's a really a lot of condemnation because they're like my righteousness is nothing man i mess up all the time look at look at the words of jesus in john john chapter 3 verse 3 jesus answered and said unto him This is him speaking to Nicodemus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, compare these two verses. And then he goes on and says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And there's the issue. That's the key. That's the issue. Born of flesh is flesh, born of spirit is spirit. The seed you're born of determines all of this and determines your entrance into the kingdom. And that, Look at these two verses compared. See that the righteousness that, the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees comes into the soul by grace when the soul is born again. Read these two together. It, it, that's what it's saying. Now, do we perfectly or at all comprehend that righteousness that's present? Absolutely not. But the righteousness that God has given to the soul as his son is present and sufficient and must be revealed. This is Paul. Remember Paul saying to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness that is of faith, that is not I but Christ. That's why Paul would say the life I live is by the faith of the Son of God. Anything else is a frustration of the grace or gift of God. If it's anything but not I, but Christ, if it's anything other than that, it's a frustration of the grace of God. If it's a work that you perform or something of your will and desire getting it accomplished instead of the grace and mercy of God accomplishing it, it is a frustration of grace. 
Now, as to the clause or the, this is from the Weiss translation, he would say, as to the clause might be fulfilled in us. Alfred would say, find its full accomplishment, not merely be performed by us. For the apostle has a much deeper meaning, namely, that the aim of God in giving the law might be accomplished in us. And the passive here is used, he says, to show that the work is not ours, but of God by his grace. This takes us back to Romans 4. And it also has to do with Galatians 3, with regard to the righteousness and life realized in the seed according to a covenant made before the law was even given. Go back to Abraham. Go back in Galatians 3 and read it. The exceeding righteousness is the life of the seed of God. For of God are you in Christ Jesus who is made unto us righteousness, sanctification, redemption. You see, all or nothing. Giving no place, such sufficiency, such completeness, giving no place to glory. No room for boasting except in the sufficiency of the Lord who is the spirit of life. For it is where the spirit is, there is true liberty. One last verse. And then we'll, we'll end this. I know this has been an extended version, but you'll have it to chew on for a while. <laughs> This is what we're talking about here is this uttermost salvation. Remember, he is able to save them to the uttermost who come to God through him. Hebrews 7, verse 18 through 22. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Saying the same thing we just read in Romans 8, 3 and 4. For the law made nothing perfect, brought nothing to its end, nothing to the goal, but the bringing in of a better hope did. This will, this will culminate in Romans 10. Sacrifices off you had no pleasure. Sacrifices and offering you found nothing that pleased you at all. Nothing brought you to your final satisfaction. Lo, I come to do your will, to take away the first, establish the second, to bring about the perfection that the law, being a shadow but not the substance, could not bring about. There is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that saith unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. That's beautiful. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament or covenant. The law was given of God to subject an entire creation. We're going to talk about it again. We're going to talk about this later in Romans 8. In hope. So the bringing in of a better hope did what the law could not do. The bringing in of the better hope brought about perfection. Not you being perfect, but the perfect one being in you. 
the perfect life living in you. And the word, all of, I don't know, I guess ever since I've been a Christian and hearing this verse uh, tr- interpreted and preached on, people will say he's the surety of a better testament, and they'll always go to where you go and you put surety money down. And that means it's, it's kind of a down payment, but it's not full payment. And they'll hold to that. That's That's not even what it means. The exegetical dictionary of the New Testament uses the word and it says standing as surety or the guaranteeing of it. The Greek English lexicon says this, one who guarantees the reality of something. That's who he is. He's the coming, he's the better hope that has come. And it's going to be so much more significant when we get into those verses in Romans 8. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not not hope for some glory to come, but the very object of glory that was hoped for is Christ in you. And it's that one who's brought about the perfection the law could not bring about. Because in that one is the life the law could not provide, but demanded That's the life that we now, by new birth, by being born of God, have come to possess through the presence of Christ our life. This is from Jameson Fawcett Brown. He says this, for surety, this is how they their commentary defines this, interprets this, the surety of the better covenant. It says that he ensures in his own being, in his own person, the certainty of the covenant. This is God saying to his son, I think it's in Jeremiah, I give you as a covenant to the people. That the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us. We'll talk about that and the last part of verse four in our next time together. Guys, uh, I'm not apologizing for going long. You can listen to this as many times you want. It's audio on demand. So you can stop it, start it, whatever you need to do. I just wanted to get this out to you. I hope this was at least thought provoking, if not a blessing. I hope it's a blessing, but it, at the least thought provoking, you should think. We're dealing with the perfect life. We're dealing with the soul now being indwelt by the one who is the full aim and intention of God. Testified of by the law. Spoken of through prophets. But now by grace resident in you. Nothing's missing here. This is an all or nothing salvation. This is an all or nothing salvation. God has not left you with one point missing. He's not left you deficient in one area, one point. He's not given you one aspect of his son and then he'll give you more later on when you qualify for it. No, that is, that would, that would violate his own standard. The law of one life in whom perfection, fullness, the full intention and aim of God is realized. That life is in you. And I pray with you and I pray for you that the desire of your heart would be to see that life, for God to reveal that life in you because he's there. And there's not one thing of it missing, lacking, or deficient. It's a life that is strong enough to keep you sure and secured, even when you can't comprehend it. Thank you, Jesus. So I pray. I thank you first. Let me just thank you guys for listening. If I'm boring you, I apologize. I hope I'm not. Let me hear from you. I hope I'm not 
boring you to tears. I hope you're you're understanding where I'm coming from. I, I love you guys, and I want you to see Jesus. I want you to know this life that God has bestowed in fullness to your soul. I want you to live in the peace and the rest of knowing a satisfied God because you begin with a satisfied God because you begin and continue in the one who is his satisfaction. Remember, we were saying it, who is able to keep you. That means from beginning to end, that keeping you from stumbling, falling, missing the mark, erring, is from beginning to end because such perfection and faultlessness is defined in him who is the beginning and the end. And I pray for all of us that the Father would reveal, open the eyes of our understanding, fill our hearts with divine light that we may know the greatness of this great salvation. Thanks again. Until next time. Amen.